Welcome back everybody. I'm going to be continuing my search for aliens with percolation theory. So this will be in the sciences playlist. I keep getting into these conversations about aliens and it led me into a, you know, deep dive into all the theories out there. This is like the fifth or I think the fifth one in the series, I guess you can call it, if you call it anything. It has a theory that is based, well, let me, um, let me look at the actual, uh, because they're using percolation theory in junk conjunction with uh, the search for extraterrestrials. So, uh, percolation theory is basically, in a nutshell, let me find it. In statistical physic physics and mathematics, percolation theory describes the behavior of a network when nodes or links are added. This is a geometric type of phase transition. Since at a critical fraction of addition the network of small disconnected clusters merge into significantly larger connected so-called spanning cluster now that's the basic roundabout this article is from universe today and its title is beyond fermi's paradox what is the percolation theory hypothesis this is by Matt Williams. I will put the link in the description. And I usually just go through the article, read it word for word. Sometimes I inject an idea or a thought that comes up. And at the end, I wrap it up. And this might be one of the last ones in this series, if we call it that. I have um, a, a big list of like things I looked at. And I picked like the four major ones that really centered on you know, where aliens are. This one was on the outskirts of me deciding to do it or not, and I just decided, you know what, all right, let me let me get to it and just read it. It'll fill up uh, content on, on the site, and it kind of fits in with this search for extraterrestrials. So I'll begin. Uh, welcome back to our Fermi Paradox series, where we take a look at possible resolutions to Enrico Fermi's famous question, where is everybody? Today we examine the possibility that Earth hasn't been visited by aliens because interstellar travel is not very practical. In 1950, Italian-American physicist Enrico Fermi sat down to lunch with some of his colleagues at the Los, a Los Alamos National Laboratory, where he had worked five years prior as part of the Manhattan Project. According to various accounts, the conversation turned to aliens and the recent spate of UFOs. Into this, Fermi issued a statement that would go down in the annuals of history. Where is everybody? By the way, this is maybe rehashed stuff. A lot of my articles concerning this kind of talk about the Fermi paradox and Enrico Fermi. This is kind of wrapping, you know, it's a little bit of a rehash, but I'll go through it anyway. This became the basis of the Fermi paradox, which refers to the disparity between high probability estimates for the existence of extraterrestrial intelligence and the apparent lack of evidence. Since Fermi's time, there have been several proposed resolutions to this question, which includes the very real possibility that interstellar colonization follows the basic rule of percolation theory. One of the key assumptions behind the Fermi paradox is that given the abundance of planets and the age of the universe, an advanced exocivilization should have colonized a significant portion of our galaxy by now. This is certainly not without merit, considering that within the Milky Way galaxy alone, which is over 13.5 billion years old, there are an estimated 100 to 400 billion stars. Another key assumption is that intelligent species will be motivated to colonize other star systems as part of some natural drive to explore and extend the reach of their civilization. Last, but certainly not least, it assumes that interstellar space travel would be feasible and even practical for an advanced exo-civilization. But this in turn comes down to the assumption that technological advances will provide solutions, 
to the single greatest challenge of interstellar travel. In short, the amount of energy it would take for a spacecraft to travel from one star to another is prohibitively large, especially where large, crewed spacecraft would be concerned. Relativity is a harsh mistress. In 1905, Einstein published his similar paper in which he advanced his special theory of relativity. This was Einstein's attempt to reconcile Newton's laws of motion with Maxwell's equation of electromagnet bleh, electromagneticism in order to explain the behavior of light. This theory essentially states that the speed of light, in addition to being constant, is an absolute limit beyond which objects can travel. This is summarized by the famous equation E equals mc squared, which is otherwise known as the mass energy equivalence. Put simply, this formula describes the energy E of a particle in its rest frame and the product of mass with the speed of light squared. Approximately, oh boy, 30,000 kilometers per second. <laughs> oh boy. You're real pro. A consequence of this is that an object approaches the speed of light, its mass invariably increases. Therefore, for an object to reach the speed of light, an infinite amount of energy would have to be expended accelerating it. Once C was achieved, the mass of the object would also become infinite. In short, achieving the speed of light is impossible, never mind exceeding it. So barring some tremendous revolution in our understanding of physics, a faster than light FTL propulsion system can never exist. Such is the consequence of living in a relativistic universe, where traveling at even the fraction of the speed of light requires tremendous amounts of energy. And while some very interesting and innovative ideas have been produced over the years by physicists and engineers who want to see interstellar who want to see interstellar travel become a reality, none of the crude concepts are what you might call cost-effective. A matter of principle. This raises a very important philosophical question that is related to the Fermi paradox and the existence of ETIs. This is none other than the Copernican principle, named in honor of the famed astronomer Nicholas Copernicus. To break it down, this principle is an extension of Copernicus's argument about the Earth, how it was not in a unique and privileged position to view the universe. Extended to the cosmological realm, the principle basically asserts that when considering the possibility of intelligent life, one should not assume that Earth, or humanity, is unique. Similarly, this principle holds that the universe as we see it today is representative of the norm, a.k.a. that is in a state of equilibrium. The opposing view that humanity is in the unique and privileged position to observe the universe is what is known as the anthropic principle. In a nutshell, this principle states that the very act of observing the universe for signs of life and intelligence requires that the laws that govern it be conductive to life and intelligence. If we accept the Copernican principle as a guiding principle, we are forced to concede that any intelligent species would face the same challenges with interstellar flight as we do. And since we do not foresee a way around these barring a major breakthrough in our understanding of physics, perhaps no other species has found one either. Could this be the reason for the Great Silence? Origin The notion that distance and time may be a factor in relation to the Fermi Paradox, has received quite a bit of consideration over time. Carl Sagan and William Newman suggested in their 1981 study, Galactic Civilizations, Population Dynamics, and Interstellar Diffusion, Jesus Christ, Whew. that signals and probes that ETIs may simply not have reached Earth yet. This was met with criticism by other scientists who argued that it contradicted the Copernican Principle. By Sagan and Newman's own estimates, the time it would take for an ETI to have explored the entire galaxy is equal to or less than the age of our galaxy itself, 13.5 billion years. If an exocivilization probes or signals have not reached us yet, this would imply that sentient life started to emerge in the more recent past, 
In other words, the galaxy is in a state of disequilibrium, moving from a state of being uninhabited to inhabited. However, it was Jeffrey A. Landis who made what is perhaps the most compelling argument about the limits imposed by the laws of physics in his 1993 paper, The Fermi Paradox, an approach based on percolation theory. He argued that as a consequence of relativity, an exocivilization would not only be able to expand so far throughout the galaxy, or uh, would only be able to expand so far throughout the galaxy. Central to Landis' argument was the mathematical and physical statistics concept known as percolation theory, which describes how a network behaves when nodes or links are removed. In accordance, in accordance with this theory, when enough of the network's links are removed, it will break down into smaller connected clusters. According to Landis, the same process is useful in describing what happens to people engaged in migration. In short, Landis proposed that in a galaxy where intelligent life is statistically likely, there will not be a uniformity of motive among ex extraterrestrial civilizations. Instead, his mode assumes a wide variety of motives, with some choosing to venture out and colonize, while others choose to stay at home. As he explained it, quote, Since it is possible, given a large enough number of extraterrestrial civilizations, one or more would have certainly undertaken to do so, possibly for motives unknown to us. Colonization will take an extremely long time, and it will be very expensive. It is quite reasonable to, to suppose that not all civilizations will be interested in making such a large expenditure for a payoff far in the future. Human society consists of a mixture of cultures, which explore and colonize, sometimes over extremely large distances. In cultures which have no interest in doing so, uh, to summarize, an advanced species would not colonize the galaxy rapidly or consistently. Instead, it would percolate outwards to a finite distance, where increasing cost and the lag time between communications impose limits and colonies evolved their own cultures. Thus, colonization wouldn't be uniform but what happened in clusters with large areas remaining uncolonized at any given time. Now this kind of makes a little illogical sense. So you can see this Earth growing, right? So we go to Saturn, we go to Mars, so on and so forth. And because it, the distance and the time and the lag, Mars's culture would change and there would be motives would change and their distance to other stars and that all kind of makes sense to me. This is why I like this um, uh, hypothesis or theory. I'll continue. A similar argument was made in 2019 by Professor Adam Frank and a team of exoplanet researchers from NASA's Nexus for Exoplanetary System Science. Oh boy. NEXSS. <laughs> in a study titled The Fermi Paradox and the Aurora Effect, Exocivilization Settlement, Expansion, and Steady States. Wow, these scientists got some great headlines. And uh, Well, these are studies. Hey? I'm a fucking pothead idiot. They, can, they argue that settlement of the galaxy would also occur in clusters because not all potentially habitable planets would be hospitable for a colonizing species. Of course, Landis's model contains some inherent assumptions of its own which he laid out beforehand. First, there was the assumption that interstellar travel is difficult due to the laws of physics, and that there is a maximum distance over which colonies can be directly established. Hence, a civilization will only colonize within a reasonable distance from its home, and beyond which secondary colonization would occur later. Second, Landis also makes the assumption that the parent civilization will have a weak grasp over any colonies it creates, and the time needed for these to develop their own colonization capability will be very long. Hence, any colony established will develop its own culture over time and its people will have a sense of self and identity distinct from that of the parent civilization. As we explored in a previous article, it would take between 1,000 and 81,000 years to reach Proxima Centauri, 
4.24 light years away using current technology. While there are concepts that would allow for relativistic travel a fraction of the speed of light, the travel time would still be anywhere from a few decades to over a century. What's more, the course would be extremely prohibitive. But getting colonists to another star system is just the beginning. Once they have settled a nearby habitable planet, and not all died off, and have the infrastructure for interstellar communication, it would still take eight and a half years to send a message to Earth and receive an answer. That's simply not practical for any civilization hoping to maintain centralized control or cultural homogeny over its colonies. Space is expensive. To put things in perspective, consider the costs associated with humanity's own history of space exploration. Sending astronauts to the moon as part of the Apollo program between 1961 and 1973 cost a hefty $25.4 billion, which works out to about $150 billion U.S. today, when adjusted for inflation. But Apollo did not occur in a vacuum and first required Project Mercury and Project Gemini as stepping stones. These two programs, which put the first American astronauts in orbit and developed the necessary expertise for getting to the moon, respectively ran about 2.3 billion and 10 billion when adjusted. Add them all up and you get a grand total of about 163 billion spent from 1958 to 1972. By comparison, Project Artemis, which will, will return astronauts to the moon for the first time since 1972, will cost $35 billion over the over just the next four years. Ouch. Well, fucking let Bezos do it, right? He's going to be a trillionaire, I think I heard. That doesn't include the cost of getting all the various components to this stage in the game. Like the development of the SLS thus far, the Orion space capsule and research into the Lunar Gateway, Human Landing System, HLS, and robotic missions, that's a lot of money just to get to Earth's only satellite. But that's nothing compared to the cost of interstellar missions. Going interstellar. Since the dawn of the space age, many theoretical proposals have been made for sending spacecraft to the nearest stars. At the heart of each and every one of these proposals was the same concern. Can we reach the nearest stars in our lifetimes? In order to meet this challenge, scientists contemplated a number of advanced propulsion strategies that would be capable of pushing spacecraft to relativistic speeds. Relativistic speeds. Whew. Of these, the most straightforward was definitely Project Orion, 1958 to 1963, which would rely on a method known as Nuclear Pulse Propulsion, MPP, led by Led Taylor of General Atomics and physicist Freeman Dyson from the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton University. This project envisioned a massive starship that would use the explosive force generated by nuclear warheads to generate thrust. No oh boy. <laughs> These warheads would be released behind the spacecraft and detonated, creating nuclear pulses. These would be absorbed by a rear-mounted pressure plate, aka pusher, that translates the explosive force into forward momentum. Though inelegant, the system was brutally simple and effective, and could theoretically achieve speeds of up to 5% the speed of light. Oh boy. 5.4 times 10 to the 7 kilometer hour. Blah, blah, blah. All right, you can read the article when I put the fucking link in here. Alas, the cost, according to estimates produced by Dyson in 1968, an Orion spacecraft would weigh between 400,000 and 4 million metric tons. Dyson's most conservative estimates also placed the cost of building such a craft at 367 billion, 2.75 trillion when adjusted for inflation. <laughs> That's about 78% of the US government's annual revenue for 2019 and 10% of the country's GDP. 
Another idea was to build rockets that rely on thermonuclear reactions to generate thrust. Specifically, the concept of fusion propulsion was investigated by the British Interplanetary Society between 1973 and 1978 as part of a feasibility study known as Project Daughterless. The resulting design called for a two-stage spacecraft that would generate thrust by fusing pellets of a deuterium helium minus three in a reaction chamber using electron lasers. Now that would be the expanse, I think, if you're familiar with a great show. It's an awesome sci-fi show. Really good novels up to a certain point, but uh, I think they kind of go with this idea of fusion propulsion. I'll continue. This would create a high energy plasma that would then be converted to thrust by a magnetic nozzle. The first stage of the spacecraft would operate for just over two years and accelerate the spacecraft to 7.1% the speed of light. This stage would then be jettisoned and the second stage would start to take over and accelerate the spacecraft up to 12% the speed of light over the course of 18 years. Wow, that seems sick. The second stage engine would then be shut down and the ship would enter into a 46-year cruise period, according to the project's estimates. The mission would take 50 years to reach Barnard Star, less than six light years away. Adjusted for Proxima Centauri, the same spacecraft could make the trip in 36 years. But in addition to technological barriers identified by the project, there was also the sheer cost involved. Even by the modest estimate, a standard of an uncrewed concept, a fully fueled Daughterless would weigh as much as 60,000 metric tons and cost over five, what, five, comma, two, six, seven billion. <laughs> Am I fucking, I'm like a Neanderthal or something. I'm no scientist, but. Jesus, uh, it's like saying 5,267 billion <laughs> based on 2012 estimates. Adjust to 2020 USD, the price tag for a fully assembled Dautilus would cost close to 6 trillion. Icarus Interstellar, an international organization of volunteer citizen scientists, founded in 2009, have since attempted to revitalize the concept with Project Icarus. Another, another bold and daring idea is antimatter propulsion. <laughs> Star Trek, anybody? Which would rely on the annihilation of matter and antimatter, hydrogen and antihydrogen particles, this reaction unleashed as much energy as a thermonuclear de detonation, as well as a shower of subatomic particles, peons and muons. These particles would then travel at one-third the speed of light, are channeled by a magnetic nozzle to generate thrust. Unfortunately, the cost of producing even a single gram of antimatter fuel is estimated to be around one trillion dollars. <laughs> <laughs> fucking money, right? I mean, one gram of antimatter, one trillion dollars. According to a report by Robert Fisbee of NASA's Advanced Propulsion Technology Group, NASA Eagle Works, a two stage antimatter rocket would need over 815,000 metric tons of fuel to make the journey to Proxima Centauri in approximately 40 years. Oof. Now my brain can't handle these numbers. A more optimistic report of Dr. Samuel Smith and Jonathan Webby of the Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University states that a spacecraft weighing 400 metric tons and 170 metric tons of antimatter fuel could reach 0 0.5 the speed of light. At this rate, the craft could reach Proxima Centauri in a little over eight years. But there's no cost-effective way to do this and no guarantees there will ever be. Mm. 
In all cases, propellant makes up a large fraction of these concepts' overall mass. To address this, variations have been proposed that could generate their own propellant. In the case of fusion rockets, there's the Bassad ramjet, which uses an enormous electromagnetic funnel to scoop hydrogen from the interstellar medium and magnetic fields to compress it to the point that fusion occurs. This is familiar to me too. It's got to be in some fucking sci-fi, right? Similarly, there's the Vacuum to Antimatter Rocket Interstellar Explorer System. Very, so how cute. Clever. Which also creates its own fuel out of the interstellar medium. Proposed by Richard Obusi of Icarus Interstellar, a very ship would rely on large lasers powered by enormous solar arrays that would create particles of antimatter when fired at empty space. Alas, neither of these ideas are possible using current technology, nor are they within the realm of cost effectiveness, not by a long shot in parentheses, under the circumstances and barring several major technological developments that would reduce the associated cost, it would be fair to say that any idea for interstellar crewed missions is simply impractical. Sending probes to other stars within our lifetimes is still within the realm of possibility, especially those that rely on directed energy propulsion, DEP, as proposals like Breaking Starshot or Project Dragonfly show these sails could be accelerated to relativistic speeds and have all the necessary hardware to gather pictures and basic data on any orbiting exoplanets. I've actually done a couple of these things. It's pretty interesting. However, such probes are a potentially reliable and cost-effective means of interstellar exploration, not colonization. What's more, the time lag involved in interstellar communications would still pace, place risk constraints on how far these probes could explore while still reporting back to Earth. Therefore, an exo-civilization is not likely to send probes very far beyond the boundaries of its territory. Here we go to criticisms. A possible criticism of percolation theory is that it allows for many scenarios and interpretations that would permit contact to have happened at this point. If we assume that an intelligent species could similarly take 4.5 billion years to emerge, the time between Earth's formation and the modern humans, and consider that our galaxy has been around for 13.5 billion years, that leaves 9 billion year window. For 9 billion years, multiple civilizations could have come and gone, and while no one species could have colonized the entire galaxy, it's hard to imagine that this activity would have gone unnoticed. Under the circumstances, one may be forced to conclude that in addition to there being limits to how a civilization can reach, that there are other limiting factors at work here. Great filter, anyone? <clears throat> Hint to my podcast, The Great Filter. <laughs> However, it is important to remind ourselves that no proposed resolution to the Fermi Paradox is without its share of holes. Also, expecting a theory or theorist to have all the answers to a subject as complex, yet data poor, as the existence of extraterrestrials is about as unrealistic as expecting consistency in the behavior of ETIs themselves. Overall, this hypothesis is highly useful of the way it breaks down many of the assumptions inherent to fact A. It also presents an entirely logical starting point for answering the fundamental question, why haven't we heard from any ETIs? Extraterrestrial intelligence, by the way. We're fucking... Because it's unrealistic to conclude that they should have colonized the better part of the galaxy by now, especially when the laws of physics, as we know them, preclude such a thing. Alright, this is interesting, and I'm finished with the article. And like I said, this was sticking around my interest in doing 
you know podcasts on where the aliens and maybe i will do some more because i do have more and these articles have links i say this all the time while you're reading through it it talks about the british interplanetary society you can hit it project Daughterless. you can hit the link they're underlined they're rich in content and knowledge you go through and you can find things and yes as i have spoken poorly some of the words are hard and the numbers are just mind-boggling i think it's leonard suskind uh a scientist of what is he called physicist uh has that idea he's like we didn't evolve for this type of math and he talks about him trying to figure out our wormholes and his battle with stephen hawking's and you know friendly one in that sense it's just you know it's awesome to try to wrap your head around and it's it brings me um such inspiration and curiosity about where we can go and like one picture here in the article shows like what a potential multi-generation spaceship would be it would be like a mini meteor rock with earth shooting through space and i was having a discussion with a friend last night and we still have to wrap our minds around the concept that right now we are on a spaceship called earth complete with its own atmosphere its own garden and you know that you know i have to keep going on and on we are hurtling through space tethered by this thing we call gravity in space-time fabric however you want to describe it and this galaxy is being held together and moving through space it's mind-blowing stuff it's just we don't stop and think about it i get up in the morning tomorrow get ready for work and it's just getting by doing what we got to do trying to make the best in life and there are people out there who look to the stars and they take the time and go to school and do the work and they come up with hypotheses and ideas about these things. And it fascinates me. I hope it fascinates everybody. Science is one of the wonderful things and one of the great memories I had as a kid growing up. I might have described this before, but I didn't like school at all. Never did. Never really got into it. But I loved science. I was so interested in the classes and all the subject when it came down to biology and it really fascinates me rather than math, which I probably should have known because it goes hand in hand with some science. And in general, this gets my excitement growing. It gives me interest in things happening around me in a space program. And it's almost said that as humans, we have to come carpent, carpent, blah, 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 whatever. We have to segment and compartmentalize. <laughs> You know, we have to, you know, segment our lives until, you know, getting by and, you know, children and their family and work and dreams and goals. And maybe one day we'll be in a situation where society is just looking up at the stars. We've conquered hunger and disease. Um, maybe there's a button people can press when they want to die. Like, there will be no aging in the sense that we think it is. At some point, you hit a certain point of life. You go to the doctor. You get your, your gene therapy. Whatever the fuck it is. Your nanoprobes. And we will be able to contemplate this crazy world, the universe we're in. And that thing about, oh, you know, I don't want to live forever. That bullshit. Because if you have the capability... It's up to you when you want to die. So maybe I'll be 3,000 years old or then some generation in front of me. <laughs> I don't think oh, it's going to be my lifetime when this happens. But there could be a generation of people who have an almost unlimited lifespan to some extent. Let's even call it a 1,000 years, 500 years, whatever. And they can decide when they want to move on. And to me, that's better than just outright saying right now, oh, I wouldn't want to live forever. Well, how about having the decision in your hands? And we have a society that looks to the stars and realizes 
spaceship Earth cannot for, be a home forever. And who knows? Maybe they'll put fucking rockets on it. There was a theory study paper I saw about moving the sun. <laughs> like, insane stuff. And yeah, these ideas are great. I would love to write books, novels, TV shows on this stuff. And I hope it catches with people. And I hope you enjoy it. My best to everybody. I might continue this series, but I might shoot off now into other things. Uh, get into some mental health aspects and psychology. But this has been fascinating. I want to thank my friends and family who put up with my bullshit. My best to everybody. I'll talk to you all next time. Bye-bye.